From Data Rails, this is FPNA Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FPNA Today. I am your host, Paul Barnhurst, aka the FPNA Guy, and you are listening to FPNA Today. FPNA Today is brought to you by Data Rails, financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Every week, we welcome a leader from the world of financial planning and analysis and discuss some of the biggest stories and challenges in the world of FPNA. We will provide you with actual advice about financial planning and analysis. This is going to be your go-to resource for everything FPNA. As a reminder, the shows now have CPE credit. If you go to the Earmark app and download that, you can listen to the show. And by answering a couple simple questions, you can get CPE credit if you need those. Also, if you enjoy the show, please leave a review on the platform of choice, Apple, Spotify, wherever else you may listen. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome our guest to the show. We have Shruti Lanka with us today. Welcome to the show, Shruti. Thank you for having me, Paul. Excited to be here. Yeah, no, I'm really excited to talk with you. So let me just tell our audience a little bit about Shruti, and then I'll give an ap- opportunity for her, inter- her to introduce herself and give us a little more about her background. So she comes from Brooklyn, New York. She did her underground undergrad in India and her master's degree at Duke University in North Carolina. She's worked at investment banking. She was the head of strategic finance at Money Lion. She's currently the CFO at public.com, where she's been the last two years. She's also a founding member of the F-Suite, a community platform for CFOs of leading venture capital funds and high growth tech companies. So we're super excited to have her on the show today and an opportunity to learn a little bit from her. So could you start by maybe just tell us a little bit about your background and you know, how you went from computer engineering to finance? Yeah, Paul, uh, yeah. I'm happy to talk about that transition in a, a short version. I'll give you the punchline before going into the details. But I, I do think it has served me well to have that dual skill set, to have a view to engineering, especially in my job as the CFO of public, working deeply with uh, engineers all day. But before we go into my background, I just want to tell you a little bit about public. Um, I think, you know, it, 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 in my specific experience also ties into why I work here. So public is an entirely new form of investment platform, right? Today, it, it's the only app where you can invest in stocks, cryptos, but also alternative assets, um, you know, such as sneakers or a fine wine collection or art that is typically out of reach for most retail investors. And the reason why we brought together this platform is to ensure that we bring customers on who can invest in line with their goals, in line with a modern portfolio theory that accounts for entirely new asset classes that, frankly, more traditional platforms don't account for. Uh, and the reason why this makes me really excited, it, you know, kind of goes back to my background, like you talked about. I am an engineer. I come from actually a family of engineers. Both my parents are also engineers. So mm-hmm. growing up, uh, you know, the, the nerdy things that uh, are probably unsexy to others were kind of my bread and butter, right? Like you literally, I I think I learned calculus ahead of most people around me. Uh, But the thing that was completely unknown to me was really the world of finance. Um, And unfortunately, you know, my parents, otherwise brilliant individuals, lost a bunch of money uh, in the markets at the time when there was very little information and um, really just no education around finance, right? And so... That really spurred me to learn a little bit more about this new world that I couldn't understand why people who honestly could solve incredible math puzzles in their head could not figure out how to you know, make a return in the markets, right? And so that's what led me down this path of navigating into finance. So after graduating from engineering, I worked at Goldman Sachs uh, and then worked at, uh, and then came to the U.S. to pursue uh, my MBA degree at Duke. And after Duke, worked in investment banking at the Royal Bank of Canada. Um, and while at RBC, I got to learn a little bit more about the fu- fundamental business models that were driving many financial institutions. Uh, and then, you know, I really wanted to take that uh, experience and bring it to bear in building a company that did better by their customers, right? And that's what brings me to why I'm at public today. Got it. And I appreciate that. That's uh, great sh- sharing that background. And I imagine, you know, watching your parents lose money and seeing them not having that uh, 
financial savvy ability and understanding of that shaped your learning and how you thought about finance, I'm going to guess. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And I think key to honestly being successful um, at finance is one to you know, find a platform that brings the that education around entirely new assets that people may know nothing about, uh, but does it in a way to serve long-term goals, right? Like so many of the other platforms that you see serve, honestly, day traders, right, uh, who are moving in and out of positions all day, or like very passive investing where you like give your money to, you know, this black box and it, it just gets invested over time. What we are looking to serve is 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 someone who wants to engage with their portfolio um, and learn along the way, and do it in a way that you know serves uh, essentially their retirement goals, their education goals, etc. And so that's what we're building in public, um, and that's what we've been successful at over the last couple of years. That's great. I appreciate you sharing that. And- be interesting to continue to watch and see how you grow and how you solve those problems. So appreciate you giving a little bit of background there and kind of color around that. So I, I'm curious, you know, you, you obviously made the transition kind of from engineering, came from an engineering background. What would you say has helped you most in finance from that, from your engineering background? I think there's two aspects to it. One, uh, I will caveat this by saying startup finance is very different from large company finance. So all of my answers, you should view it from a startup lens. And I think, you know, to be a compelling startup finance executive, you need to have a very deep understanding of the fundamental data and metrics that drive the business. In a startup, you cannot really work only on what are lagging indicators, which is gap accounting, right? Like revenue, net income, et cetera. These are great metrics, but they tell the story after, not before major company events. And so it's extremely important to understand what really moves the business. And the way to do that is to be deep in the data. And so in my role at Public, I also oversee the data and analytics team, and I did this at Moneyline as well. And I think it's it's uh, the the reason I can do that is because of my engineering background, um, and that plays a very large role in ensuring that I'm keeping the company strategically focused on the things that matter, um, and that eventually lead to the success of those lagging metrics, which are you know revenue and financial metrics. I, I appreciate that answer, and I agree with you about that importance of leading indicators. One thing you mentioned, it looked like at you know your last company and current one, you have ownership over data and analytics. And I have questions just came to my mind around that. I've had a lot of discussion with people, and I've seen a lot of debate of people saying, "Hey, data and analytics should sit in finance, should sit under the CFO." No, it should you know sit outside. And I think there's a lot of arguments that can be both ways. What's kind of your thinking on that, and why have you felt like you've wanted that under? finance and with the you know kind of CFO and the finance organization. Yeah, I want to be really clear that there is no data or analytics organization that can be effective without deep partnership with engineering, right? So uh, I think that it cannot be done in isolation for sure. And there are very heavy engineering skill sets in doing it successfully. Having said that, all analytics are is it's a very powerful tool. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. And the question is, what do you point that tool towards? Now, in the early stages, especially of a company where day to day decisions affect outcomes in large ways, it's really important to stay focused on the business questions that matter the most. And that typically tends to be driven by the CFO at companies our size, right? And so this is why I think the analytics team sits nicely um, in the CFO office. It's because there are so many good questions to answer, but you need to know what is important to your investors, to your customers, to long-term success. And you need to solve only the most pressing questions first. And so that's easily done when you're close to the business. 
I, I see what you're saying there in the sense of being able to finance as close to the business and really knows what the pressing questions are. What do the investors want to know? What are the key things that are really going to drive the business forward? And making sure there's alignment between the engineering and the analytics to ensure that's where the focus is spent. I can definitely see where that drives a lot of value. That makes sense to me. I appreciate that answer. So I noticed, you know, we talked about this in the intro. You're a founding member of the F Suite. Can you maybe tell our audience a little bit about that? You know, how you started it and what you hope to accomplish with that? Yeah. Uh, so the, the F Suite is a great organization that you know was started by the team that actually uh, founded Tech GC, and they you know before the group was brought together, they involved me and a couple of other CFOs in order to really figure out what was relevant to the C- startup CFO community and how best to serve it, right? Uh, and the reason why I love being involved with the F Suite is that I get as much as I put into it. I, I, I'm able to you know share learnings, things that you pick up along the way, uh, you know, after years of being a startup finance professional. But at the same time, if I have a pressing question or if there's a, if there's a very niche um, problem that I'm looking at that may pertain to, for example, an FP&A tool, or like a corner of you know accounting uh, guidance that has recently come out. There's a ready community of experts that I can lean on in a confidential manner. And so uh, my involvement in, uh, in F Suite is really both to um, lean on those experts, but also honestly share the expertise I've built up over the years. And it, I, I, I really do love giving back. I can understand that and I can see that. And that sounds like a great way to give back and also to benefit you meeting with a lot of, you know, experts, like you mentioned, you know, in accounting, something new comes out and ask me how others are implementing it or how they're thinking about interpreting it, whatever it might be, technology, different things. I could see where having that network could be invaluable. So, you know, you've been CFO at public.com for two years and I know you guys are private. And so, you know, limit on how much you can talk about, but maybe can you talk a little bit about, you know, what are the key things you're looking at at public? Like, what are you trying to track in the way of metrics or are there key, you know, kind of leading indicators and things you really look on that help you get a good insight into how the business is performing? Yeah, I think uh, it's incredibly important when you're at a company this size to get extremely proficient with what, you know, I call uh, startup metrics or cohort metrics. So in addition to looking at very traditional, you know, financial metrics, like like we talked about revenue, profits, margins, and losses, which, you know, you look at it as January versus February, it's extremely important to track the usage as well as behavior of a set of users over their lifetime, and then compare that against the next set of users. So these cohort metrics really, I think, make or break most startups' success. And this, I think, is the number one thing. So even if, you know, as as a CFO, obviously you have to stay on top of, um, you know, gap metrics. But even if you don't, I would say the the more important piece really is the success and failure of your cohorts. That and, and cash, uh, cash is king, especially, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, most startups are not um, profitable. And, and so managing cash closely, having an effective treasury function um, is the second kind of biggest area that I maintain focus on. Yeah, and how do you, and not just at public, but just in general, how have you typically thought about cohorts? I mean, do you have a way you like to do, you know, segment them? Is it usually time-based? Is it demographic? How do you, how are you typically kind of segmenting your cohorts for that analysis? Uh, it's a great question. I think that, uh, so I, I think cohorting on other demographics is best done by your, you know, product design marketing teams. I think in order to drive the business forward, the thing that matters the most is really time-based cohorts. And the time that you uh, look at in finance, it tends to be, it depends on the context, you know, for your board, you may look at quarterly or monthly, right? 
but really, in order to move the business, you have to be looking at weekly. And this is the other big difference between a startup finance act executive and at a, a larger company, right? It's rare to find, you know, CFOs and FP&A professionals working on the weekly and daily basis, but this is absolutely imperative um, at a young, fast-growing company. Now, I can see that, the much shorter time frame, you know, like you said, weekly, monthly, and I can exactly relate to what you're talking about at a big, mature company, not looking at it near as often. I managed the uh, traveler's check for American Express about six, seven years ago, you know, not exactly a growing business, obviously. In fact, you know, declining rapidly, but, you know, we had to look at all the cohorts around what we call abandoned property and trying to figure out what would be in cash for our liabilities, right? We were looking at that was one year at a time by currency. Mm -hmm. 40 years back, right? That's going to be very different than a startup environment. Yeah, it was all the way back to, you know, 1980 or what, I think it was 1979 at the time, I think one of the years or something. And you know, that, was an, that was an inter interesting model. <laughs> yeah, yep. It was pretty amazing. And you're trying to figure out, you know, then after 40 years, we just assumed they weren't going to encash them. And if they did, you just brought it back on the balance sheet. But that was another story. So that was really kind of, you know, interesting and just shows the spectrum of, the difference you can get between a startup and a real long-term mature company and how you're looking at things. So I appreciate that, all those metrics, and I can totally understand, you know, leading, really focusing on those things that drive the financials versus looking at the financials because they're after the fact, right? You want to influence it before the financials come out and make sure it's healthy. The other thing you mentioned is cash. And, you know, obviously the economic environment we see right now, everybody concerns of it, you know, being in a recession or recession coming, you know, higher interest rates, inflation. Do you have any advice you'd offer for, you know, kind of people in FP&A, particularly, you know, startup around just managing cash, the burn and in runway in the environment we're in? Yeah. Uh, I think that this is a portion of the business where you simply do not wear your rose colored glasses, right? So uh, you all FP&A professionals in general have to think in terms of scenarios because we all know that no model is perfect, right? <laughs> so we've got to maintain humility around that and know that you can be completely wrong about many of your projections, especially in a recessionary environment, which is why it's extremely important to look at your runway in the absence of all revenues as well. So I like to run three scenarios. There's, you know, the, the, there's the base case. This is what we expect. You know, this is what we've generated in revenues in the past. This is what we expect to generate in the future. All, you know, reasonable assumptions make sense. Uh, th th there should absolutely be an upside case. And, you know, we, uh, we, we've experienced that a couple of times. For example, I joined public in uh, late 2020, uh, right before GameStop, which happened in, in um, January 2021. And it was kind of the perfect confluence of a few factors. One, you know, people were at home with COVID and there was a huge interest um, in really this short squeeze activity, which led ma to massive retail inflows. And seemingly overnight, we went from like relatively young startup to having over a million members. Um, and, and so that we, we, that was greater than any upside case we had, you know, factored into our model. So I think you, you, every model should also have a, an upside case, but for the purpose of managing cash, assessing runway, I also like looking at a, you know, no revenue or low revenue case, right? Like only your firmest contracts, only your firmest uh, revenues are included. Uh, and what if you literally stop collecting checks? What, what would that mean for the business? And laying out these scenarios, not only for yourself, but also for the CEO is extremely important because you need to be on the same page about, um, you know, what the, what the various options for the business are in each of those scenarios. I appreciate that. And I like how you said having that, you know, the bear case where you're just looking at the the minimum, what you're pretty much guaranteed to make and saying, okay, now what do we do in this environment? That means cash runs out here. That means, you know, we have this much in expenses and we're losing this much or whatever, you know, that that case is. And I, yeah. I also, like I said, I would, sometimes... I, I, I one, sorry, mm -hmm. Paul, I interrupted no, you, but uh, <laughs> I would add one thing. I think that 
look, uh, we talked a little bit about cohorts and how they need to be managed weekly, but the reality is most, you know, FP&A teams uh, run monthly, right? It's, it's, yep. it's, it's, it's unlikely that it's more frequent than that. Cash has to be managed weekly. And if, if a CFO is not managing cash weekly, I would be worried. <laughs> Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, especially in a startup environment and any environment. You got to manage your clap your cash more closely than your gap accounting. Yeah, make makes exactly. a lot of sense there. You know what it is like: thirteen different spreadsheets emailed out to twenty three different budget holders, multiple iterations, version control, errors back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. Data Rails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Data Rails takes data from all of your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex. Consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up to date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. So, you know, obviously being in the CFO position, you now uh, kind of, you have ownership for a number of different departments within the finance organization, but in particular, how do you think, you know, FPNA can better support the CFO and the senior senior leadership team? You know, what what advice would you give to people in FPNA is the best way they can help support the team? Yeah, I think so. I think FPNA is one of the most important functions, right? Like frankly, the, the entire finance function. F, but the reason why FPNA is so key, particularly for uh, senior leadership, for executive leadership is because of this forward-looking angle, right? Like the this view on uh, what if this launch goes well, what if this launch goes poorly, right? Like, so that scenario planning and putting it in the context of the business while um, partnering deeply with um, various kind of business counterparts to make goals and targets clear, as well as drive the right inputs into the model, uh, is 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 what FBA is you know adds the most value through. So said another way, for executive leadership, it's extremely important that FBA clearly lays out the options and the path forward. What moves the model the most? What moves the model the least? Right. But in order to do that effectively, FBA has to partner deeply with. Uh, product managers, business owners, people in the business to ensure that the formula that's represented in the Excel model is accurate and you're driving uh, the right inputs. And frankly, I think this is what makes the FB&A job fun, uh, particularly at a startup, because a lot of times you're um, coming up with what is the right view for this particular business. It's not uh, set in stone. There's room for creativity, and that's what makes uh, I think FP&A fun, particularly at companies our size. Uh, I would agree with you. Working with the business and help, you know, shaping it so to speak, and figuring out what those key drivers are and how you move forward. I think that's the fun part. I love you know the business partnering and learning that and thinking about the unit economics and those different type of things. So you talked a lot about really you know understanding business, the forward-looking, partnering with them, a deep understanding of the drivers. How do you ensure that, you know, the financial, the operational, the strategic plan, that all hangs together? Because at the end of the day, you know, everything's kind of judged on how you perform financially, right? How you achieve those targets. So, you know, FP&A doesn't necessarily have responsibility for setting the strategy. You know, obviously they don't, they can input it. They're not doing the operational planning, but how do you, how have you found the best way to Make sure FP&A helps ensure that that's all aligned. 
and that you don't have, you know, disconnects in that process. Yep. I think, you know, translating the strategy to FBNA, that is honestly my job, right? Like as CFO, I need to ensure that if we're making any strategic shifts, we're accurately involving FBNA counterparts. So it is it's it really is on the CFO to be the bridge between mm-hmm. what is the strategy to um, how is that represented in the model. Um, uh, and on the other side, translating the operating to the financial, this goes back to some of the partnerships I talked about. Uh, so building deep partnerships across the business. But overarching all that, you need a really strong process. Um, and what we do here at Public is a monthly FP&A meeting. I think regardless of what's happening in the business, regardless of the number of things that are going on, you know, whether there's a board meeting coming up, whether there's other things that you may put pressures on time, um, we treat this monthly FP&A meeting as sacrosanct. And I think that's the way it should be because you optimize what you measure. And so you have to measure your progress against targets. And that leads to optimizing them automatically uh, if you do those periodic check-ins. I really like what you said there about you optimize what you measure. And if you don't have the periodic check-ins, you're not going to be able to do that optimization. So that, that makes a lot of sense of treating that as as critical, having those meetings and really making sure that everybody's on the same page. I, I appreciate that. So um, one question we like to ask everybody here is about maybe a, what we call a failure they've had. And the way I was, I've always tried to look at failures as their learning experiences, not really failures. But maybe you can tell us a time, you know, in your career where you had an experience at work, something that failed, like maybe an analysis that went wrong, a meeting, you know, an implementation process, whatever it might be, and what you learned from that experience, maybe how it helped shape you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, prior to my role at Public, I ran strategic finance at Moneyline, which basically included FP&A, but also product pricing and a couple other pieces, which, mm-hmm. you know, what lead to that title. Um, and what was interesting about that company, and to some extent, this is true of Public as well, is we had a mixed business model, right? We It was a consumer lender that had um, also a su- subscription, also other user-driven revenues. Uh, and it was going from being just a consumer lender to more than that, right? Um, and so we went through, I think it was before one of the capital raises, um, we went through most of our prep with essentially an old version of our model. But then we found that the storytelling wasn't quite working, right? Um, we We could not really forecast effectively some newer portions of the business with the older uh, lender-driven model that we were running. And so it forced me to uh, really rethink the structure of the entire model and change it to be flexible enough to drive kind of longer dated cohorts, which is typical with lending, but also uh, shorter dated cohorts with like subscriptions and other pieces, which, you know, can see changes on the fly and you don't have like contractual, uh, you know, waterfalls uh, around payments right? in the same way that you would with the, with, with a loan. Uh, and so I think the failure there was not recognizing that the business had changed so much that the model had to be completely redone bottoms up to account for the various business models. Uh, and the moment, uh, you know, I took two or three weeks to step away, start from scratch, which is always <laughs> daunting, right? It's like uh, building the plane while flying it. But uh, but I took the time and worked, you know, all night. You know how that goes. Uh, but the moment I did that, something clicked and it was much easier for both internal and external stakeholders to understand what the key drivers were and what the outcome would be. And so, you know, that taught me that particularly at startups, you need to look, um, you know, bottoms up at your model frequently because what worked yesterday may not work today. That is that is great advice. And I could see where, you know, you definitely learned that 
that lesson of the reminder to look at things. I can remember one company I was at, you know, we built a new model and it was pretty good at forecasting, but the business really couldn't understand it because the products weren't right. We had a lot of mess with the data and, you know, it took me quite a while to figure out, I'm like, I got to rebuild this. But you mentioned like flying the plane, but I'm coming into budget season and this thing is a, it was just a monster of a model. And I was like, but I got to do it. I can remember I was spending 10 hours and why isn't this line tying? Why isn't that just working through it? You know, once I got it done, it really drove the business forward because I could help them understand each product, where things are growing, how the transactional and the subscription and the call center and all the different pieces played together. And so, yeah, I can definitely relate to that and the challenge that can be. That's definitely a good learning because I've I've had more than my fair share on those things with different plans and stuff where you're like, all right, that was an expensive learning experience. (laughs) <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, Talk I heard me one the lunch. other day. And I, yeah, exactly. Well, I heard one the other day where I can't remember where I read it, but uh, back in the 60s at IBM, the, C, the CEO, there was somebody who had made a mistake and it cost the company $10 million. He got called in the CEO, CEO's office and figured he was going to get fired. And he goes, I'll go ahead and pack my bags. And the CEO goes, why would you pack your bags? I just spent $10 million training you. I'm not going to fire you now. <laughs> Like you're gonna make that mistake again, you know. Really good point. And I I really love the way that, like, it was a very expensive learning experience. I've spent my money. Now I know you'll do better. That's (laughs) exactly right. So, can you talk a little bit? You know, as you look at FP&A and you look out to the future, what do you see as the biggest opportunity for the profession, and then also the biggest challenge? Yeah, good question, Paul. Um, You know, it it makes me think you know, fundamentally about kind of what are we building in public and, uh, and you know, what can we do better? So if you look at our business model, right, we looked at the, you know, broker-dealer landscape and said, yeah, we have a lot of competitors who've built new technology, but they're all doing it in the old paradigm. So why don't we rethink that and we, we went in and said, okay, we won't accept payment for order flow because it doesn't incentivize us to align our, uh, uh, to align our outcomes with our customers. And so the day we stopped accepting payment for order flow, uh, essentially an entirely new way of operating uh, a trading platform and investing platform was born, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and so if I apply that philosophy which is, you know, what can we do better than, you know, anyone around us? I think the biggest opportunity for, uh, you know, FB&A professionals is one to, like, move to simplicity, right? Uh, like, it, is, like, it is much harder to build a simple model than it is to build a complex one. Um, and, and, The day we did that at public, the day we moved to simplicity and transparency by saying we will build a business that aligns our incentives with our customers, it made it much easier for our users to know what we stood stood, stood for, for our board to know what we stood for, and for us to make decisions day to day around the product. And you will find that this is the case even with your forecast and your model. If you choose simplicity, you will know what you know what to include, what to exclude, what level of detail you need to have, um, and you know how to. And forcing that simplicity will honestly make you understand your business better. Uh, in terms of the biggest challenge, I mean the obvious challenge is the environment we're in. Right? Who knows what what is to come? Not even over the next twelve months. Over the next six months, uh, there is interest rate uncertainty. There is, frankly, just the threat of more serious war, right? Uh, This is a difficult uh, macro environment, and that leads to challenges for everyone, but particularly for anyone who's trying to forecast the future, right? Um, And so I see that as a challenge, but again, I go back to like lead with simplicity and lead with transparency. Um, and it's the only way you can message your various stakeholders why you've made certain decisions around what you're forecasting. Okay. So, so if I hear it, I, you know, on, on the two sides you have on the, uh, you know, the challenge is the macro environment is one of the biggest, all the uncertainty, like you mentioned, interest rates, inflation, war, are we in a recession? Are we not? You know, all those different environments that you don't control. 
but you need yep. to be able to manage, right? You have to yep. help the business manage. And then I really liked, you says the opportunity is really focusing on simplicity. You know, as I've yep. heard it said, complex is easy and simple is hard, yep. right? It's it, I, I'm guilty of it. It's sometimes really easy to build that complex formula in Excel for your model. Yep. And then yep. nobody understands it. They're like, what in the world did you do? Oh, yeah. it works. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, but yeah. nobody can understand how it works. Like, All right, That's well, I'll exactly rethink right. it. So yeah. I, I get that. And I, you know, I struggle sometimes with that myself of wanting it to be overly complex and reminding myself, okay, keep it simple. That's what people yeah. like. So I think that's great advice because I definitely see an FP&A. We all have a tendency, I think sometimes to be over analytical and get a little too deep in things and sometimes sipping, stepping back and just looking at it through a lens of how can I simplify this? What's really the key factors here in this story? Yeah, that's exactly right. Great. I, I like that. So one question we like to ask all our audience, and this is one where we get a little more personal, is what is something that is unique about you? Something they wouldn't find online that you could share with our audience? Oh, man. Uh, I, you know, I, there are, I, I can think of a couple things, <laughs> but uh, I used to be ambidextrous for actually a large portion of my life. And then I became majority right-handed, but there was, there was a long time that I could you know, do a lot of things with with both hands. And I think this is one that you cannot find uh, easily online. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with that. So did you just naturally tend toward using your right hand more and you kind of lost being ambidextrous or how did that yeah, transition kind of happen? happen. Uh, yeah, I think I think it was honestly cultural, right? Like I think most cultures actually place an emphasis on using your right hand, which uh, mm-hmm. uh, which is somewhat unfortunate. So I think it went away over time. But I, when I was very young, there, there was I, I would write with both hands. I had a slightly different handwriting, but they were actually like surprisingly similar. Um, but it's still better on my right because it, there was a lot more focus. And then as you get older. But so many other things. I, I this is one of those skills I lost. But yeah, this is, this is a little known fact. No, I like that one, and I can definitely see there is, as you said, in most societies, right? Things are built for right-handed people most of the time. We've got better at now accommodating left-handed yeah. people, so to speak. But definitely, overwhelming majority of things have always built for people who are right-handed because that's the majority. And unfortunately, yeah. that can cause some challenges for those who aren't right-handed. Yeah. So. Yep. All right. So this next question, this is one Data Rails likes to ask all of our customers. You know, we're sponsored by Data Rails and they're, uh, you know, a big fan of Excel. Their platform is built around Excel. So we like to ask everybody what their favorite Excel formula it can be formula, function, feature, any of the above, what it is and why. Yeah. Uh, my favorite is index match, which, as you know, <laughs> is not one formula, but two, but uh, it's way more efficient than VLOOKUP. It runs much faster and I hate me look up. And I know that is a very controversial statement, but um, yes, index match all the way. Yeah, no, we definitely had a, a most, I'd say that's probably one of our most common answers. We've had a couple of set X lookup. I think we've had V lookup once, but yeah, anytime you go into the, what lookup should you use in Excel? You get people come out with their pitchforks sometimes. You're like, really? It's not, <laughs> yeah. As long as it gets the work done. Is what I like yeah. to say, but I, I I do appreciate index match. It's definitely a more uh, flexible formula for sure than yeah, some of the exactly right. the others. Yeah. So I I can appreciate that answer. So last question here, I've really enjoyed our time together. We just have one more question, and if you were to give some advice to someone starting their career today who wants to work in FP&A, what advice would you give them? Uh, yeah, I think that there is no uh, successful. Uh, at least startup FP&A candidate who's not deep in the data. So actually my advice may be, I, I, I don't know, you'll tell me whether this is routine or not, but I would say learn SQL if you can. You need to be data literate um, to be really effective at understanding whether you're looking at the right metrics, whether you're pulling the right numbers. Um, and that dual skill set will help you honestly partner better with your technology counterparts, which everyone, you know, most companies today have large engineering and technology teams. Um, so, and it's a, a simple language to learn. Yeah, I, I like that answer. You know, obviously you get a lot of people have different opinions. I think a lot of it depends where they worked at large companies, small companies, you know, what background they came from. But I learned SQL in my first role but, and a little bit before I moved into finance and FP&A and it served me 
it's been invaluable in my career. It's really helped me a lot with the data. I learned Power Query. You know, I have a Master of Science in Information Management to go with my MBA. So I, I tell people they should learn SQL. You should at least learn the basics. You need to be able right. to work your way around data and have the conversations. You may not be the one pulling it. Do you need to get all detailed and be able to write a 20 page query? No. Yeah, you know, it's not your, your job isn't to sit and pull data, but you got to at least be literate is what I tell people. And learning the basics of SQL is not hard. Totally agree. I'm glad we agree on this. <laughs> yeah, when I'm on the same page as you. I've had that discussion. There's one other guy that is big in the space on LinkedIn. He's kind of always on the opposite end and we go back and forth on this debate. So <laughs> I'm glad I have someone that's on my side. That's always good. Well, we've really enjoyed having you on the show today. Appreciated you carving out some time for us. And I'm really excited for our audience to get the opportunity to listen to this. So Truthy, thank you for being on the show. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much, Paul. And uh, I look forward to more great content from you.